In this video I'm going to talk about coordination compounds. So another thing that transition elements can do um, that we haven't seen a main group elements do is create complex ions. So a monatomic cation can combine with multiple anions to make a complex ion. And the reason that transition elements do this is generally because they uh, have they have um, more orbitals as they get bigger, so they have d orbitals, they have electrons in d orbitals, and these electrons in d orbitals can uh, create different kinds of bonds than, um, than we've seen so far. So the, when we look at a, a metal ion in the middle, a transition element in the middle, the attached anions that are attached to that transition element are called ligands and the charge on the complex ion, we have to determine what that charge is by thinking about the contribution from every element that's in the complex. So when a complex ion combines with counter ions to make a neutral compound, it's called a coordination compound. So this is an example of a formula, a chemical formula of a coordination compound. So cobalt is a transition metal, and this transition metal is in some oxidation state that we're going to have to uh, determine the oxidation state by looking at the contributions of the other elements that are in the formula. <coughs> um, and there are groups that are attached to the middle ion. In this case, there are six molecules of water, H2O, that are attached to the middle ion. And we also see that outside of the brackets, there are three chloride ions. So um, the, we think there are a lot, there's lots of information when we're looking at a coordination complex. We can think about the primary valence, which is the oxidation number of the metal. We have to determine what's the oxidation number of this metal. And again, we have to do that because transition metals have so many possible oxidation states that we don't know exactly what oxidation state it's in in that compound until we look at what it's attached to. And the secondary valence in a coordination compound is the number of ligands bonded to the metal. So in this case, um, I see that there are three chloride anions on the outside of the bracket. So we've seen chloride before, and we know that Cl has a minus one charge. So if I have three Cl's, then on the outside of the brackets I have a minus three charge. So that means that what's on the inside of the brackets must be a plus three charge. Minus three, plus three, and the whole compound is neutral. We don't see a charge written on the compound here, so that, that indicates it's neutral. So H2O is a neutral molecule. H2O itself doesn't have a charge. So if it's minus three on the outside, and it's plus three in the brackets, and the H2O is not contributing anything to that charge being neutral, then the plus three charge is coming from cobalt. So the oxidation number on the transition metal on cobalt is plus three. That's the primary valence. The secondary valence is the number of ligands that's bonded to the metal. So the ligand is the uh, group that's directly stuck to the metal, and the whole coordination compound is within the brackets. So anything that appears outside the brackets is not a ligand. Only, ligands only appear inside the brackets. So in this case, if this is the central coordinating ion, then this is the ligand, H2O, and there are six of them, and we call this the secondary valence, or more often we call this the coordination number. So the number of ligands that transition elements can be stuck to generally ranges from 2 to 12, and we usually see 6 and 4. Most compounds usually have 6 or 4 ligands here inside the brackets. So here's an example of what that looks like. Here's cobalt. These are, this isn't H2O, but these are NH3 molecules. And so cobalt has a plus three oxidation state, and it's making these bonds to uh, NH3. So these are called coordination bonds. And a coordination bond is different than a, uh, uh, than a regular covalent bond because a coordination bond, both of the electrons in the bond are being donated by the ligand. 
So cobalt doesn't have any electrons to donate. It's cobalt 3 plus. That means it's already lost electrons, 3 plus. It doesn't have any more electrons to donate. It's not going to make a covalent bond. We generally don't see uh, metal ions making covalent bonds. They make ionic bonds. They have a positive charge. They're going to be attracted to things that have a negative charge. So this is different than what we've seen before, where the metal, a metal is making a covalent bond. And the reason that a metal is making a covalent bond is because the ligands themselves can donate their electrons. Remember, nitrogen has a lone pair of electrons. And it can donate its lone pair of electrons to a central metal ion because the electrons on nitrogen are actually more stable when they're sitting in an orbital on cobalt than they are when they're sitting on an orbital on the NH3. So all these NH3s say, oh, I, we, there's a place where we can sit our electrons, make them more stable, we can rest for a while. So they all I'll rest their electrons in orbitals on the cobalt 3 plus, and we create this coordination complex, this complex ion. So in these coordination bonds, they are covalent bonds, but that consist of two electrons, just like a regular covalent bond, but both of the electrons are being donated by the ligand. And if, the, if NH3 is a neutral molecule, which means it doesn't have a charge, and the cobalt is in the 3 plus oxidation state, then that means the charge on this whole complex is, is plus 3. And if this is a plus 3, and I always have to balance the charge, then a plus 3 attracts 3 minuses. So this compound here with a plus 3 charge needs 1, 2, 3 counter ions that are negative to balance its charge. So in solution, these things are going to be floating around in solution, and right next to them are going to be 3 chloride ions to balance the 3 plus charge. And this whole thing is kind of a system that kind of floats around together inside of a solution. Complex ion formation is a type of Lewis acid base reaction. So um, remember, a Lewis acid is a compound that accepts electrons, and a Lewis base is a compound that donates electrons. So uh, the Lewis acid in this case is the transition metal. It's, it's these ions that are capable of accepting electrons because they have orbitals for uh, these ligands to rest their electrons. And the Lewis base is, of course, the ligand that has extra electrons that it can donate to that central ion. Uh, the bond that forms when a pair of electrons is donated by one atom is called a coordinate covalent bond. So again, it, it is a covalent bond, but both electrons came from the N. Both electrons were on the nitrogen. None of the electrons in that bond were on the silver. And now it's just like a regular bond. Um, where both electrons came from nitrogen. So um, a lot of the ligands like H2O or NH3 or Cl minus, they can bond, make one bond with the central metal atom. But some ligands, we say they have extra teeth or that they have more than one lone pair of electrons and they can make more than one bond to the central metal ion. So we call these uh, bidentate ligands. So for example, um, this ethylene diamine molecule here has two nitrogen atoms. And if NH3 has one lone pair, then this molecule that has two Ns has two lone pairs. So if NH3 here can make, if one NH3 molecule if one NH3 molecule can make one bond because it has a lone pair of electrons, then a molecule that has two of these groups can make two bonds to that central metal atom, one with this lone pair and one with this lone pair. So sometimes we call these chelating agents. And a chelate is a complex ion containing a multi-dentate ligand. So this one is bidentate. It can uh, bond to the central metal atom twice, one molecule, can make two bonds. Sometimes one molecule can make three bonds, or one molecule can make four bonds. So here's an example of some common ligands that can be stuck to central metal atoms. Even though there's two different lone pairs on water, 
it's only going to use one or the other. It's not going to use both at the same time. So water cannot make two bonds to a central metal atom. It can only make one bond with one or the other lone pair. N can make one bond. Chloride has four lone pairs. But again, it's only going to make one bond to the central metal atom. It can't make four bonds or even two. It can only make one bond. Carbon monoxide has a lone pair here and a lone pair here. So technically, carbon monoxide could bond on this side, or it could bond on this side. Same with cyanide. It has a lone pair here and a lone pair here. It could bond here, or it could donate this one. It can't do both at the same time because of the geometry. It's either going to be pointing the N at the central metal ion, or it's going to be flipped around, and it's going to be pointing the C at the central metal ion. But if the C is pointing at the central metal ion, the N can't also be. So the N can't also make a bond. Same with this one. Either the S can bond to the central atom or the N can bond to the central atom. Here with the oxalate, I have lots of electrons, but the electrons that are going to make a bond here are the ones down here. This, this O has three pairs. And because of this geometry that this pair is pointing this way and this pair is pointing this way, this oxalate ion can make two bonds. One bond can bond to the central metal atom here, and one bond can bond to the central metal atom here. Ethylene diamine can make two bonds because it's a big molecule. It can wrap around with one, two, three, four atoms between lone pairs, and it can wrap around and make several and make two bonds to the central metal ion. This is called ethylene diamine tetraacetate, or EDTA for short. And EDTA can make six bonds to, oops, can make six bonds to a central metal atom. One, two, three, four, five, six. So here is uh, um, a close-up of the lone pairs on EDTA. So EDTA we call a chelating agent, and what a chelating agent does is it can bond very strongly to metal atoms, metal ions that are in a solution. If I have a metal ion in solution that's capable of forming complexes like a transition metal, then putting EDTA in that solution is going to cause this molecule to really get stuck to that ion. One, two, three, four, five, six bonds to that ion. So we can use chelating agents to trap ions in a way. If the ion is a heavy metal atom that's poisonous, we can use chelating agents to, to trap it so it can't otherwise do the chemistry that would make it dangerous. Um, if we need to dissolve something and the metal ions are really insoluble and they're stuck to their anions, the cation and the anion are stuck together so we have an insoluble uh, salt, I can add chelating agents which will grab the cation. It has one, two, three, four, five, six places to grab that cation and pull it away from the anion, which will help the compound dissolve. So chelating agents are really useful for many different applications. And what they do is they trap cations. They trap ions that are capable of making complexes. Here is, um, let's see, which one is this? This is ethylene diamine. So here's cobalt 3 plus in the middle, and here is one molecule of ethylene diamine. Alright, so here. That's one molecule. Bonded twice. You can see here's one of the lone pairs on N is making this bond to cobalt, and this lone pair on N is making this bond to cobalt, and they're stuck to these carbon atoms, which helps the molecule to bend around so it can bond this uh, central metal atom. Here's another one. Here's N, H2, a, cent uh, a lone pair that's making a bond to the metal. Here's the CH2 atoms that help it bend backwards. Here's the next N. And here's the lone pair that that N makes to the central metal atom. And then uh, the third one I've got, here's the bond to the metal atom. Here's the bonds to the CH2 groups that are holding it together. And here's the last bond to the metal atom. So again, this metal atom has uh, 
the coordination number is six, it's making one, two, three, four, five, six bonds, but it only has three ligands because the ligand, one, two, three, each ligand is bonding twice. And here is EDTA, so this is only one molecule. So let's try to trace this whole molecule here. So this is cobalt-3 again, which is capable of making six bonds, the same six bonds it's making here in this octahedral uh, shape. So this bond comes from an O, this bond comes from an O, this bond comes from an O, and this bond down here comes from an O. These bonds, that's four of the bonds, these bonds come from an N. Here's a bond here that comes from N, and here's a bond here that comes from N. So those are all the six bonds to cobalt. And now this is the same molecule, just wraps around. So let's wrap it around. It starts here, and it goes to carbon. We have this bond, and we're bonded to nitrogen here. That nitrogen is bonded to a carbon down here, and a carbon over here, which are bonded together to this nitrogen. which is bonded to this carbon here, which is bonded to this carbon, which is bonded to, where's this one? Oh, I see this nitrogen here is also bonded to this carbon, and to this carbon, and to this oxygen. And these guys kind of bend around backwards like this. So this is all one giant molecule, one molecule that's bonded to this ion six times, made six different bonds to this molecule. So the geometries that complex ions generally take are if there are two ligands, then it's going to have the same kind of geometry we saw uh, with a compound, a molecule, that has two atoms. We call that linear. The bond angle is going to be 180 degrees. If there are four ligands, uh, we saw these two geometries before. Four atoms, generally we would say that is tetrahedral. Um, and if I have four ligands stuck to a central metal ion, we, it has the same tetrahedral geometry where all of these bond angles are 109.5 degrees. Um, but sometimes we can get a situation where four ligands is actually going to result in a square planar complex uh, where the bond angles are actually 90 degrees apart. Right? And we have nothing on the top and nothing on the bottom. So we'll look at the situations where we can determine if I have four ligands, how do I know if it's going to be this shape or this shape? Well, it has to do with the metal ion, and we'll look at the electron configuration that causes a square planar geometry. So two ligands is always linear. Four ligands can either be 90 degree square planar or 109.5 degree tetrahedral. Six ligands is always octahedral. And remember, octahedral has all of these bonds are 90 degrees because this is kind of like a X, Y, and Z coordinate system, all perpendicular lines.